longstanding urgent cares for what pediatrics. Kind of, what kind of patients do you see in, in an Ms. Lowe, did you ever have an occasion to treat a patient by the name of Layla Daniel? I did. Okay. And Your Honor, at this time I move into evidence states 173, uh, which is a, a complete copy of um, Layla Daniel's uh, medical records from Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, encompassing her uh, entire life, um, and as well as states 174 uh, through 181. Uh, which are uh, medical records specifically pertaining to the visit that she had with Ms. Lowe. And Ms. Lowe, do you recall the specific date that you treated uh, Layla Daniel? No. Okay. What did help? Do you need to look at the? Let me ask I mean, you this: was... Do you have an independent uh, independent recollection of this this uh, this visit? Do you have any independent recollection of this visit as you see here today? I mean, I, in, I remember the child, I remember the visit, but I don't remember the exact date. Okay. I can show you states 174, <coughs> that will help you. Do you recall the day um, that Layla Daniel um, came in to see you? Yes. And what day was that? Um, October 19, 2015. Um, and do you know who brought her in? Um, the foster mother. And do you know the foster mother's name? Yes, uh, Jennifer Rosenbaum. And what was the reason why um, Layla was brought in to see you on October 19th? Um, she came in for a leg injury. Um, did you receive any sort of history uh, from Ms. Rosenbaum? I did receive history. Do you want? Yes. Okay, what was so that history? Um, she reported that. Um, she had been at gymnastics and had fallen and then had been unable to uh, walk after gymnastics and that um, she had been at a, her grandmother, maternal grandmother's a couple of days before and the report was that she had fallen in a hole um, and then she had maybe perhaps re-injured her leg when she had fallen at gymnastics. But since she had been in gymnastics, she had not been able to walk on that leg. So um, just so we can get the timing correct, um, did she indicate when the fall at her grand great-grandmother's house was? She had said the fall had been a couple days prior. Um, and then uh, the fall at gymnastics, did that occur the same day as the visit or a different day? Um, it, did, it looks like from the note that it was, um, she'd fallen off the bar a couple of days later and won't walk, but, and I don't, it doesn't say on the note if that was the same day or prior. Did you um, do an exam of Layla once she was brought in? I did. So um, it's an urgent care center, so we do a pretty focused exam following. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what do you oh. mean by focused exam? So what the patient tells us is, or what the parent tells us is wrong with the child, we do a, pre a directed exam at, at that area. Can you give us an example? So she came in reporting that her leg was hurt and she was limping, so we direct most of our attention at her leg. Um, and so what kind of exam do you do when a child comes in with that kind of complaint? So we overall look at, overall look at the child um, and then palpate the extremity um, that is involved, watched her walk, um, and you know, manipulated the leg and then ordered x-rays. Okay. Um, what were your observations um, what, for Layla's uh, visit that day? Um, I mean, it was a long time ago. Um, so, I mean, she looked like a two-year-old that was limping. So you said you ordered x-rays? Correct. Um, now, did you have an opportunity to review those x-rays yourself? Yes. Okay. Do you, uh, are they also examined by somebody else? So, um, most of the time they're also examined by the, my attending in the urgent care, and then they're read by a pediatric radiologist at Eggleston. And is that done electronically? It's done electronically. Where is, we've heard a little bit about Eggleston. Where is Eggleston? Eggleston's in Decatur. Um, and so a radiologist up there will, do, will read them? A radiologist up there will read them. Okay. I want to show you what's been previously admitted into evidence as States Exhibit 176. Uh, 
Do you recognize States 176? It's behind you. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And um, what do you recognize? Uh, what do you recognize that to be? Um, so it's an X-ray of her right lower leg, and she has a fracture um, just below her knee at the top of the tibia, and there's a questionable bowling fracture of the fibula, which is the other lower leg bone. So none of us are doctors in here. So, so if you could uh, to kind of tell us, and if you wanted to use there, this, there's a uh, laser pointer on there, so that'll help you. So right there, there's a fracture, um, and it looks like the... Um, this top part of the tibia is compressed a little bit, which when you fall quickly into a hole is what would happen. So you thought that, that, that falling into the hole could have, could, could have contributed to that? So, yeah, falling into the hole and then re-injuring it if she's falling off a bar at gymnastics. Let me, have you, let me ask you this. Given the history that was provided to you by Ms. Rosenbaum, did you have any concerns at that time about child abuse? Um, I did not have concerns about child abuse, I th but I was a little bit concerned that maybe the child had been neglected when at the grandmother's house to allow her to fall in the hole, but if felt that she was in safe care with the foster mother, um, so she was not in any imminent danger. But um, if, if I understood you correctly, you thought that it was the sequence of events that made sense as far as this particular injury, correct? Correct. Um, what kind of, and we can have the lights come up at this point. Thank you. Um, what kind of um, treatment do you do for this kind of fracture at the urgent care? Um, we would put her in a splint um, and then have them follow up with an orthopedic doctor. So you don't ca do casting there? We don't do casting. Do you recall if Dr. Eanes actually um, uh, observed the x-ray in this particular case at the time? I don't recall. Um, did you ever receive a, no a call from any other doctors in this particular, for this particular case? I received a call from the orthopedic doctor um, a couple of days later. Um, I guess he and he was not happy um, about the child, um, and he had sent the child up to Eggleston for evaluation, I believe, after he'd seen the child. Did you ever have any further uh, involvement in uh, treating Layla Daniel at any other point in the life? No. Nothing further this time. Thank you. Ms. Cross. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Corinne Meyer. I have just a few questions for you. If I don't speak up loud enough, please let me know if I'm not clear. Um, you diagnosed Layla otherwise as healthy and well-nourished, correct? Um, she, I didn't diagnose her as that, but she appeared to be healthy and well-nourished. She appeared to be healthy and well-nourished. Correct. In fact, you noted that. <coughs> you noted she was well-developed and well-nourished. Correct. Um, and you didn't make any notation with regards to abuse or any, anything of the sort? No. Thank you. I don't have anything further. All right. Thank you, ma'am. You can stop. Any objections? Excuse. No objection. Okay. And you're excused. And Mr. Chase was very good. Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You can put your hand down and take a seat. Take a seat. Thank you. Can you please state your true and correct name for the record? Uh, my name is uh, John T. Eanes II. Okay. Can you spell your last name for us? E-A-N, as in November, E-S, as in Sierra. Okay. Sir, how are you currently employed? I'm employed from the uh, Children's Health Care of Atlanta as the Medical Director for Utilization Management and Case Management. Okay. And how long have you been in that position? Uh, three years, sir. Prior to that, uh, where were you working? Um, uh, at the, uh, prior to that, just prior to that, I was working at the Urgent Care uh, system for children's at the Hudson Bridge. How long were you at Hudson Bridge? Oh my, at least three years, I believe. I'd have to look back at that, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, were you working there in 2015? I believe so, yes. Um, tell us a little bit about your educational background. Um, I'm um, a medical doctor. I uh, was trained at the Virginia Commonwealth University. 
uh, in Richmond, Virginia. That was my undergraduate. Then I went through the military and went through the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. Then did internship at William Beaumont Army Medical Center in El Paso, Texas, and residency at Walter Reed. Um, and how long have you been a pediatrician? Uh, so let's see, 96. It'd be, 96 was when I graduated medical school, completed residency in 99, and I've been a pediatrician since. And how many years were you in the urgent care type setting? I would have to look back because I was doing it um, part time for quite a while, so it was at least uh, at least six years, I believe. Did you have, ever have an opportunity to treat a patient by the name of Layla Daniel? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Um, and do you recall uh, the date that you first treated Layla Daniel? Um, I would have to look back exactly. This is the record here. Sure, or I can provide you with states 173. It was 173. Yeah. Yeah, that, that had the dates that she was actually. You have to forgive me. I didn't recall the exact date. Um, this was the consent form. Make sure this was mine that I saw. I apologize. This is her account. Was that the four, 426 appointment? Hold on. There's a couple of accounts. I just want to make sure I'm looking at the right record before I say the exact date. Where is my note? Hold on one second. There it is. This would have been... Oh, no, that was the second encounter. So that was date 1019. So this must have been... Uh, 613, I believe. So June 13th, 2015? I believe so. My apologies. I didn't memorize the dates. That's okay. That is correct. 613. All right. And where were you working on uh, June 13th? Um, Hudson Bridge uh, Urgent Care. And um, who was Layla brought in by? Uh, it was a foster mother, if I remember the name correctly. I've got to look back here and see Oops, who was the mom. Uh, Patricia Lambert, is that correct? And um, what was the reason why Layla was brought to you on June 13th, 2015? She had been vomiting at the time. Um, did, she, did, you, did she give any more information about the, the history of vomiting from that day or the days leading up? It had been indicated there were numerous episodes of vomiting prior to the foster mother picking the patient up, but um, and had one additional episode after she picked her up, but no other symptoms. Okay. Um, were any um, the medical history was any sort of uh, medical conditions provided to you as part of their medical history? Uh, they had denied any other medical history, although they did indicate that the child was in foster care for maternal meth use. Uh, was there any mention of any previous physical abuse to the child? Uh, no, sir. Now, what did you do as far as the physical exam of Layla on that day? Um, it'd, be a, it'd be a focused exam looking at heart and lungs, abdomen, uh, uh, a general look at the skin, the head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. Okay. And did you um, make any notes regarding uh, the height and weight of the child? Uh, we had a weight of 10.6 kilograms. I don't believe we did a height that day. Oh, and is that within normal range? Uh, I believe so. I'd have to look at the growth chart, but uh, typically, yes. Did anything appear to be abnormal as far as her, her nourishment that particular day? Uh, no, she seemed to be doing quite well. And um, what else did you do as part of your exam? Uh, the head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. We just kind of look at it, all, her, um, all her parts per, uh, around her head, her chest, abdomen. Um, Expose and examine her abdomen, make sure there's no evidence of any serious illness. Okay. Now, um, when you looked at the abdomen, did you note anything uh, unusual about the abdomen? No, not on the exam. If you had, would you have noted it? Uh, typically, yes. I want to show you State's Exhibit 45. Okay. Is this pic that yeah. picture? That, that picture right there. The, yes, sir. The area underneath the, the belly button, uh, did you observe that, um, that hypopigmented area um, when you examined Layla Daniel? Uh, no, sir. Had you have observed that, would you have noted it? 
That, that's a significant uh, discoloration, so yes. It's simply asking if, if that's something that he would have, um, if, if he had seen, he would have made sure to include in his records. Objections overruled. Yeah. The, the, with that discoloration, that would have been commented on, um, uh, just because it's an unusual type of hypopigmented area. Um, at, as a pediatrician, um, is it part of your training to um, identify potential signs of child abuse? Yes. And what kind of things do you look for um, when you're evaluating potential signs of child abuse? Unusual physical exam findings, bruising, uh, pattern bruising. Um, it's kind of a spectrum of things. Some of the symptoms can be subtle, so you've got to look for different items. Um, and when Ms. Lambert brought the um, brought Layla in on that day, did you did you have any concerns about potential child abuse on that day? No, sir. The lights can come up for now. Thank you, Doctor. Um, and you have a copy of the medical records. Um, was Layla ever seen at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta on August 20, August twelfth of two thousand and fifteen? Uh, not per the records. Did you ever have, um, I guess, any other contact with a case with a medical case involving Layla Daniel? Um, I had a I had um, a contact later as a supervising physician okay. uh, for physician assistant. Um, so tell us about that. Tell us about how that supervising physician works regarding uh, physician assistants. When we, when the urgent care facility, the physician assistants will do a lot of additional help for the providers, and we just review the charts for completeness and make sure that the documentation appears appropriate. And do you recall the date of the visit uh, that uh, you reviewed the chart? That was on uh, 1019. And who was the child seen by on 1019? Uh, I believe it was Tina Lowe, if I remember correctly. Uh, let me double check here. Yeah, Christina Lowe. And what was the reason why she was brought in? Uh, let me look back here real quick. A leg complaint. Not uh, weight bearing and now limping on the leg. And did you actually see Layla Daniel that day? No, sir. Is it common for you to not see the patient uh, when they come in if they're seen by another provider? If the physician assistant feels comfortable with the case, yes, we won't see them. Um, what about the x rays? Did you uh, see any of the x rays on 1019? No, I did not. I just reviewed the reports. Um, did you ever see the x-rays? Yes. A couple of days later, we received a call from the orthopedics expressing concern about the x-rays, and then we saw them. I'm confused what she's really said. And this is simply goes to why, why he, he looked at the x-rays. I'm not offering a truth the matter, sir. It simply goes to why he went back and started looking at the x-rays. It's a Sir, you can continue. The, um, a couple days later, we received a call from the orthopedics expressing concern about the x-rays. At that time, I reviewed the x-rays. Okay. And when you reviewed the x-rays, um, did you have any concerns yourself? It, it was an unusual fracture. I'm showing you what's previously admitted to States Exhibit 176. Um, you said it's an unusual fracture. Tell us what you mean by that, and I'll hand you a laser pointer, um, if that might help you explain uh, to the jury. Um, oops, let me make sure I know what I'm doing before I shoot anybody. There, yeah. The area of fracture is very close to the knee itself, which requires an enormous amount of force. And um, so when I would see a fracture like that, the other risk is to the, is to the growth plates themselves. So this would have been a fracture we would have recommended uh, talking to the orthopedic doctor about. Um, um, and why, so you say that it, it's in the, uh, in the, it would have required an enormous amount of force. Uh, this is a thick portion of the bone. Um, so it's not something um, you just simply break per se. Um, by a simple, you wouldn't break it by a simple fall or it'd be something you'd know that there was an injury at the time. So a simple fall would not would not cause this kind of fracture. Correct. What about pain? Um, would this type of fracture cause pain? Easily. How much pain? A lot. 
Would it be uh, the type of pain that would be immediately known to the child? Correct. What about those around the child? Easily. Now, from this ex from this X-ray, can you tell anything regarding the timing of when this injury could have been could have been inflicted? The exact time you wouldn't be able to decipher. However, it's a recent injury; it occurred very shortly. And in, in uh, layman's terms, could you give us, the, I guess, the range? I would expect within the last day. Now, you had mentioned that you had. Um, spoken to the orthopedic doctor, correct? Correct. Um, after speaking with the orthopedic doctor and looking at this x-ray, um, what, if anything, did you do? Um, the, well, there was a couple of things. The orthopedic doctor expressed concerns, and we recommended, if he was concerned about the injury, to refer to the ER or try to help. The other thing um, that uh, occurred in this is I contacted the physician assistant because I was a little concerned about the x-ray report to see if she had additional information not documented in the chart. And did anything uh, that you learned from her, and you don't tell us what she said, but is there anything that you learned from her that, um, that affected your opinion or caused you any additional concern? Uh, she had made some additional comments supporting the case, and I had indicated that these needed to be documented in the chart. Um, did you call defects or law enforcement or anything of that nature? Uh, no, sir. I wasn't directly seeing the patient. So we would made recommendations to the orthopedics if they were concerned, but that's all we did. Thank you. Nice to meet you, ma'am. questions for you today. Please let me know if I'm not speaking loud enough or you can't understand. Oh, absolutely, ma'am. Um, this injury was documented in your uh, office as an injury consistent with accident falling in a hole and then falling in gymnastics, wasn't it? That's what was reported in the chart, correct? Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Do you want me to leave these here, sir? Mr. Trace, do you have any directions for this witness as to what to do with the exhibits? Oh, I can take them back. Okay. Thank you, sir. And your excuse? Unless you're still Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You can put your hand down. Please state your true and correct name for the record. Uh, Gilbert Shondock Spurry. You just want to probably talk a little okay. bit closer to the mic. Gilbert Shondock Spurry. Can you, spell, uh, can you spell your name for us? G-I-L-B-E-R-T-D-U-X-B-U-R-Y. Sir, how are you currently employed? Um... Currently, I'm on a hiatus between two jobs. I was at Texas Children's Hospital, and I'll be starting at University of New Mexico in a month. And what are you going to be doing at the University of New Mexico? Pediatric orthopedics. And what were you doing at uh, Texas Children's Hospital? Pediatric orthopedics with the emphasis in spine surgery and trauma. And do you, tell us a little bit more about your educational background. I went to medical school. I went to graduate school at Georgia State. I went to medical school at University of Alabama, um, Birmingham. Then I did my residency at Atlanta Medical Center. What was your residency in? Orthopedic surgery. <clears throat> and then I did a pediatric orthopedic fellowship at Emory um, based out of Eggleston. Now, um, tell us a little bit more about the pediatric orthopedic uh, fellowship. How is that different than just general orthopedics? Dealing with just kids and pediatric 
orthopedic problems. So dealing, instead of adult fractures, adult orthopedic problems, dealing with pediatric specific only children. And are um, orthopedics related to children different than the uh, orthopedics related to adults? Yes. Can be? They can be. Okay. Um, tell us, do you have any medical licensures or certifications? My medical licensure? Yes. I'm licensed in the state of Georgia. I'm licensed in Texas, and I will be licensed in New Mexico in a few weeks. Okay. Um, do you have any, um, uh, any teaching positions, or have you in the past? I'm an uh, assistant professor at Texas Children's Hospital, and I'll be an assistant professor at Georgia State. Oh, I'm sorry, at New Mexico. Have you uh, ever done any uh, research um, in the field of orthopedics? I have. And w just tell us a little bit about that briefly. <laughs> Mostly in spinal deformities, but I've also done, when I was in medical school, some um, research into orthopedic trauma. Your Honor, at this time I would uh, move to tender Dr. Duxbury as a expert in the field of pediatric orthopedics. He's admitted for that purpose by the court. Thank you, Judge. Dr. Duxbury, I first want to talk to you about um, a certain case. Did you ever have an opportunity to treat a patient by the name of Layla Daniel? I did. And do you recall the date that you treated Layla Daniel? I do not recall the date. Your Honor, at this time I move into the uh, record, um, the medical records associated with Dr. Duxbury's treatment, there is a corresponding business record certification that's self-authenticating. Admitted. We're going to show you State's Exhibit 182. Would this help you with some of the uh, details? Yes. Okay. If you could tell us the date that you treated Layla Daniel. I saw the patient on October 20th, 2015. And do you have an independent recollection of this uh, particular visit? I do. And why is that? Um, it stood out to me because I was very concerned that it was a non-accidental trauma case. What was the reason why Layla was in your office? She was brought to me because she had been seen the day before, I believe, um, by one of the Children's Health Care of Atlanta Urgent Cares who had referred her to me for a lower leg fracture. And when you, when you, got, the, um, when you got the case, were, did you also get the x-rays that were associated with this particular case? I did. And um, did you have any concerns when you looked at the x-rays? Not just from the x-rays, no, um, although it was somewhat of an unusual fracture pattern for somebody the patient's age. So it was the, the fracture pattern. Tell us a little bit more about why that was concerning to you. It was a complete fracture of the proximal tibia, which requires a fair amount of force to generate, usually more force than somebody that's the patient's age can generate. Let's back up. and. Let's back up and talk a little bit about the history. Were you given a history um, regarding how Layla injured herself? I was. Um, well, let me ask you this. Who um, provided that history? It would have been the foster mother. And do you have a name for the foster mother? I don't recall the name. Is it in the, is it in the records that have been It is. It is. Jennifer Rosenbaum. And um, when the patients come and see you, do they actually fill out a form regarding the history? They do. Okay. And is that included in those records? It is. All right. I can see that fact from you. Turn it back in public. Right. So this, the, just do an overview real quick. 
The section over here on the left, this section, who would this have been filled out by? That would be filled out by the guardian of the patient. Um, and in this particular case, was that uh, signed by someone? Yes. Um, and the signature right here? Correct. Now this section of, above it, in here, that I'm pointing to, kind of on the right, who fills out that? That's filled out um, by one of my assistants in clinic. And where do they get that information from? Directly from speaking with the guardian. So based upon the history that we see here today, or we see on this form, I should say, what was the history that was provided to you regarding um, how this child injured themselves? The history that was given was that initially the patient had been playing at her grandmother's house and fell into a hole injuring her leg, and then subsequently, subsequently the next day at gymnastics had fallen again and injured herself the same leg. Now, did uh, Ms. Rosenbaum provide specific dates uh, in this history? She did. She said the first occurrence was on October 15th, and the next occurrence was on October 16th. The October 15th, what, was, what did she say uh, caused the injury on October 15th? She said that she had stepped into a hole, I believe. And this, uh, the October 16th, what did she say happened then? On October 16th, she said she lifted her leg for a pike and fell. Are you familiar with that term, is a pike? I think I know what a pike is. Okay. Did she also um, write anything regarding the child's history, um, did she write anything herself regarding the child's history? No. She, uh, I mean, she stated that she was, that the patient was the second of three children of three pregnancies, um, that she didn't have any major illnesses, no operations, no medications, no allergies to medications, but, and she stated that she was adopted. Okay. Now, what does it say underneath adopted? History of abuse. So you indicated that she had actually been to uh, Hudson Bridge prior to uh, coming to see you, correct? Yes, sir. Is that pretty standard procedure for them to go to the urgent care and then come see you? Yes. Um, so let's look at the x-ray. And I guess what caused you concern based upon the history that you received? So this is just, this is your knee joint, and it's looking at it from the front of your body. So this is the end of the big bone in your upper leg, and these are your two bones in your lower leg. So this is called the proximal tibia, and this is called the distal femur. There is a complete proximal tibial fracture, which comes through this part of the bone is called the metaphyseal bone, that comes through the metaphyseal region of the bone. Complete meaning that the fracture goes all the way across the bone, that if you took this bone apart, these two bones wouldn't be attached through the fracture at all. Um, and the history that was provided to you, did that seem consistent with the injury that you were observing on X-ray? So, it, possibly. If she stepped into a very hard, large hole going very fast and fell, but that would make it, but it's unlikely still that she would have that fracture pattern. So if she fell in a large hole at high velocity, it could be possible but unlikely, is that correct? It could be. What about falling off the um, falling off of a, a, a bar or a beam in gymnastics? Most likely not. Depending on how high the beam was, if the beam was five or six feet off the ground, perhaps. Um, 
What if the beam was only a couple feet off the ground? No. That it would not, this fracture would not be possible? It, it should not be possible. She shouldn't be able to generate enough force to cause that fracture. And I, I don't know how much I'm allowed to. If she had injured, if she had had this injury the first day stepping in the hole, there isn't any way that she would have been able to be participating in gymnastics the next day. Now, what about a combination of the two? Uh, hurting, the, hurting the bone perhaps slightly one day and then even more the next day? If she had hurt the bone the first, if she had fractured the bone the first day, she wouldn't have been walking on it after the fracture. painful is this type of injury? It's painful. Would it be known pretty easily to those around the, a child? Yes. How do children normally express uh, pain when they have broken limbs? They won't use the limb. Did you conduct a physical examination of Layla? I did. And um, what did you note from the physical examination? So she, she was difficult to examine. She didn't cooperate. She was very fussy. Um, it's difficult to get two-year-olds to cooperate with a physical exam to start with. And when they're hurt, they're even more reluctant. And, and oftentimes, they don't particularly want to be at doctor's offices. So she had pain and swelling around her knee on the affected side. And I didn't notice anything else significant at the time. Now, would you have looked at the entire body and done a full body exam of Layla? I would have. Did you notice anything at that point, any bruising at that point? I didn't. Um, did you examine the arms at that point? I did. And did you notice anything uh, unusual about the arms? I did not. Now, did you ever um, discuss your concerns with any other treatment providers? I did. And who were those providers that you discussed your concerns with? The day that she presented to clinic, I called the urgent care, the CHOA urgent care that she had seen, had been seen at initially and referred her to me and discussed the injury and my concern for non-accidental trauma with the attending emergency room physician there. And then subsequently, I wound up discussing the patient with a social worker and a child protective service worker at Eggleston, and also one of the nurse practitioners, I believe she was a mid-level at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, or I'm sorry, at, Children's, at the time it was Children's Orthopedics of Atlanta, which is now Children's Healthcare of Atlanta Orthopedics. I'll back up a little bit. Um, first, let me ask you this. The, um, what was the time frame between when the um, first injury allegedly happened and when she, was, when she came or first saw treatment? I can put this back up on the screen it, for you if that helps you. It was close to a week. Um, what was the date? The date that they said the injury, they said that, can you pull it down a little bit? Oh, on 10, they said it happened on 10-15, and then I saw the patient on the 20th. Okay. And she had been to Hudson Bridge, Bridge the day before? I believe so. So that was about a four-day delay? Yes. Okay. Um, is there anything uh, regarding the delay that causes you concern? Yes, it's one of the, when you look at a list of risk fract, risk, risks associated with non-accidental trauma, one of the big red flags is delay in treatment. And why is that? Because if your child has a broken leg or an injury, isn't using the leg, you would expect that you would take them to, the, to a provider quickly and not wait to have them see a provider after the injury. Now, the fracture that we saw on the screen, um, a complete tibia fracture like that, is this a common fracture to see in children? 
a complete tibia fracture in that region and in somebody her age is not common. Now, you said that you called over to um, Hudson Bridge, correct? Yes. And you discussed your concerns with them. Um, now, what did you do um, after you discussed your concerns with the providers over at Hudson Bridge? The day when she was, when the patient was in clinic? That's correct. The day the patient was in clinic. So I splinted the patient, and I asked them to go to the Eggleston Emergency Department. And why did you ask them to go to the Eggleston Emergency Department? So in the community clinic, I don't have the ability to do a non-accidental trauma workup. And what is a non-accidental trauma workup? It gen the initial workup is doing trauma labs, which is measuring certain enzymes, liver enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, blood count, um, and then doing a complete body x-ray, where you're, it's called a skeletal survey, where you're looking for other fractures. Um, and you, did you express this directly to the foster mother? I'm sorry, um, I don't remember. Did you tell them they needed to, to, to go to Eggleston? I did. Um, and is it saying you don't remember exactly what you said? I don't remember exactly what I said to the family, but um, I mean, I was explicit that they needed to go to Eggleston that day straight from the clinic. Um, did you do anything in your medical records to memorialize your visit? Yes, I believe so. There was, a, was there a letter that was sent? There was a letter that was sent to Seth Carson and Karen, who was a primary care provider that I had lots of referrals from in my Stockbridge office. Okay. And uh, in that, in that uh, letter, did you write anything regarding your concern? I did. And it, I'm showing what's on the screen is states 182, the medical records. If you could read the history of present illness. It says, this is a two-year-old who, per mother's report, initially injured herself on 10-15, almost a week ago, playing in the backyard at her Nana's house, and she fell into a hole. The next day, she was at gymnastics practice. She lifted up her leg for a pike and fell, apparently re-injuring the leg, at which point, according to the mom, she stopped bearing weight on the extremity. They then waited until 1019, so over the weekend, to take her in for evaluation. She was taken to the Children's Urgent Care last night where x-rays showed a proximal tibia fracture. She was placed into a splint and sent here for follow-up. Did you ever do anything to follow up to see if they had actually gone to uh, children's health care like you instructed? I did. So um, I had a very close working relationship with the residents at Emory, which cover are the initial contacts for orthopedics at Eggleston. I called the resident that was on call and let them know that the patient should be coming. I also called the ER and let them know that they should be coming. Um, to your knowledge, did Miss um, Rosenbaum ever take Layla Daniel to Eggleston? She did program? not. So I followed up that night by looking at Epic to see if they had ever showed up at the ER, and they had not. And what is Epic? Epic is a, a electronic medical record that um, Children's Health Care of Atlanta uses. It's accessible from anywhere, so you can look, and any visit in there would be documented. Do you recall if Ms. Rosenbaum um, ever said anything acknowledging the, the need to go to Eggleston? She did. She said she would go. Did she say when she would go? She said she would go that afternoon. I asked her to leave immediately and go to the emergency department, and she acknowledged that she would go, that they were on their way. So later that night when you called, they had not come? I checked in Epic and they had not gone and I called my resident and confirmed that they had not showed up and that they were not waiting to be seen. Sometimes you can be wait to be seen for a long time out in the waiting room and they weren't there. Did you do anything else to follow up? I did. The next day I called up to Eggleston and called the ED which put me in contact with one of the social workers who was there then with said that they had CPS in-house and talked to them about the case. And what is uh, 
CPS? Child Protective Services. So the information you received that Child Protective Services was, was involved? So that, it was at that point that I got a clear understanding that there was already an open defects case on this patient. And um, that they were following her. So your understanding was that defects was following this child? Yes. After that, did, um, did that do anything to allay the concerns that you had? Uh, I, I don't remember, but apparently not, because I still made other phone calls. Okay, and tell us about that. So after that, I could see in Epic that the patient was seeing another provider from a different group. And I called that provider and um, relayed my concerns to them about the patient. At, after that point, did you have any further treatment and uh, involvement in the treatment of Layla Daniel? I did not. Doctor, I want to show you some other x-rays, okay? I want to show you what's been previously admitted as a So that is a view of part of the humerus, the large bone in the upper arm, and then both the bones in the forearm and a partial view or a complete view of her wrist and part of her hand. And um, you, have, you did not actually uh, treat Layla on November 17th, correct? I did not. I splinted her, the leg. Back in October. Right, and, and ask them to follow up at Eggleston. Yep. Um, but looking at this particular x-ray, just as, a, as an expert in this field, do you, what, do you see, um, what do you see when looking at this x-ray? There's a transverse, non-displaced um, fracture of the, her ulna. So in English, what does that mean? That means that she has a break in her ulna that isn't moved out of place. The bone is still lined up where it should be. Um, it's in the middle of the bone, and there's also a, there's also a fair amount of healing around the fracture. Okay. Um, let's talk first about um, the mechanism. Can you tell anything regarding the mechanism of how a break like this occurs? It's called a nightstick fracture. Why is it called a nightstick it's fracture? It's called a nightstick fracture from back when law enforcement used to carry nightsticks. And it's the natural response of somebody being attacked to put their arm up like this. And if you put your arm up like that and get hit by a night stick, night stick, you could get a fracture of the ulna. So it actually has a pseudonym that goes along with what was that common from the mechanism. Um, what other types of things could cause this type of fracture? getting hit a blunt force trauma to the side of the arm that the ulna's on. That's about the only thing that can cause that fracture. Now, you mentioned um, there's some healing here. How can you tell that there is healing here? So all of that fluffy cotton ball looking. If you, if you need to, you can get up and with the pointer. and uh, We have the old I forgot school pointer, too, if that's point. better. is called callus. So all this, and that's called bridging callus. When the callus goes across the fracture site, it's called bridging callus, and that's the way fractures that are treated by cast immobilization or no immobilization heal. So at first, there just would have been a line that goes across right here if you had seen her early on in this fracture. Within about 10 days, this callus would start to form. And the callus forms almost like an onion skin 
or an onion in that it forms layers. And as that callus gets thicker and thicker and thicker, it keeps the bone from wiggling. And once the bone stops wiggling enough, the cells that take bone away and form bone come in and reunite the fracture. So it's basically the body splinting the fracture so that those cells can then come in and do their job and heal the bone up. And is this, um, is this the type of healing that would occur, you said, if, if the arm had not been splinted? Yes. Okay. Even if it's the kind of healing that would have occurred if the arm had been splinted. It's, it's, there's two mechanisms that bone can heal by, main mechanisms, either primary healing or secondary healing. This is called secondary healing. Primary healing is if you do a surgery and you put a rigid a plate and screws to hold the fracture in place, the fracture can't wiggle then, and you don't get a bunch of callus formation like this. In children, it's very rare to put plates and screws in or any sort of orthopedic implant because they heal so well, especially at two years old, that you could you can put the bone almost anywhere, leave it where it is, and they grow so much that the bone heals back together, and then as they grow a little bit more, it re, it remodels. Excuse, excuse me, so that eventually the fracture disappears. Okay, so um, I guess this goes back to the, the kids. Uh, kids sometimes heal a little bit differently than adults. Yes. And so you said that um, at, a, at a certain point, you wouldn't even be able to, to see the fracture line anymore. If you had let this go and taken the x-ray again in six months, you never would have known the fracture was there. Let's talk about, um, we talked about that the callus begins to appear in about t- ten, 10 days. Ten days. Um, what about um, the, this being on the, on the other side? How, how old could this be? By looking at the fracture, I would say that it's no more than three to four weeks old at the most. Are you familiar with the term non-union fracture? I am. And what is a non-union fracture? A non-union is when the bone, the two ends of the bone do not heal back together. And is that what we are looking at here? No, that's normal healing in a pediatric fracture. Is there any evidence whatsoever from looking at that photograph or from that x-ray that there is any sort of non, non-union appearing here? No, that's perfectly normal looking for a, that fracture. Now, um, is, how likely is it for a two-year-old to have a non-union fracture? It's almost unheard of. When would you see a non-union fracture? Non-unions usually happen in in adults. Um, And usually adults that have comorbidities, such as diabetes, have other things going on that have diabetes or they have some sort of vascular problem or they've had a bad infection. Um, Children, I've never seen a non-union in one of my patients. is self-authenticating uh, medical records uh, from Millie Place from Piedmont Henry um, Hospital. The, the business record certification is attached. Admit. Doctor, I also want to show you um, states 184. What are we looking at in states 184? That's an x-ray of a pediatric patient's elbow. Um, it would technically be called an oblique view because it's looking at, at, at an angle, which shows a healing fracture 
at the end of the humerus right there. So How can you tell that that's a healing fracture from what you're pointing at? This is called periosteal reaction. Um, everybody's bone is surrounded by a tissue called periosteum. In children, the periosteum is very thick and robust because their bone is growing so much and changing so much. As we get older, it gets very thin. But in somebody this patient's age, the periosteum will be very thick. And when you have a fracture, you get, even if you can't see the fracture initially on an x-ray, which would be called an occult fracture, um, which happens a lot around elbows. Um, if you come back and take an x-ray at two or three weeks, you'll see this periosteal reaction forming, tracking up, and then as the fracture heals, that will go away within three or four months. I'm just going to also show states 185 and 186. Um, is there anything different that we can see in this particular um, x-ray? There's there's still periosteal reaction there. There appears to be a fracture over on the lateral condyle of the bone over here. This is the lateral condyle. So look, there's a lucency through there, but you can still see this periosteal reaction coming up. In stage 186. There's, real, um, there's really no visible fracture healing on this. There might be a very, very, very mild periosteal reaction right there. And so um, from what you can see, about how old would this injury have been from what you can see on x-ray? And I can move it back to the first. And I can move it back to 184. This would probably be about between two to three weeks old. This is uh, looking at Layla's ulna from, uh, that was taken on November 17th of 2015. Um, now you said that you start to see the callus at about how, how long? So part of it depends on patient age. In very young patients, you see it very, very, very quickly. Um, as patients get to be teenagers, you don't see it as quickly. They start to heal more like an adult. And somebody... Um, two years of age, you'll start to see the healing and callus usually around 10 days. And then you also said that it could be, uh, this could also be up to about three to four weeks, correct? That, yeah, that probably looks like it's about, I would say median of three. Median of three. Right. Okay. So something, so from looking at that, the, the fracture probably occurred within that time period of 10 days up to about three weeks. Yes. Okay. Duxbury, good morning. Good morning. My name is Corrine Mall. I just have a few questions for you. Yes, ma'am. If you can't understand what I'm saying, I'm not speaking loud enough, please let me know. Okay. Dr. Duxbury, you saw her on the 20th, correct? Yes, yes ma'am. And you saw her uh, for the purpose of putting a cast on her, correct? I saw her for the purpose of treating the fracture. Which doesn't necessarily intending, especially in an early fracture, doesn't involve putting a cast on immediately. Um, but you did not treat it, did you? Define treat. I saw the patient and I put her into a splint, which didn't, would be the initial treatment for that fracture. Didn't she come to you in a splint? She did, but you have to take the splint off to examine the extremity. So you put the splint back on? Yes, ma'am. And uh, then you um, told her to go to, to Eggleston. Yes, ma'am. She had just come from Choa Urgent Care, and you were sending her back to Choa Eggleston, correct? So, yes. 
Um, now I just want to talk a little bit about your um, your medical records that we had looked at. Um, this letter to um, Dr. Sankaran just says that you are concerned about the history of this child, correct? No, ma'am. It says I'm concerned for non-accidental trauma in this case. Okay, and where, where do you say that? Can you put the record up? So go down to the bottom. Keep going down. There should be another page. So it says, I'm a little concerned about the history of this child and the amount of time it took for the urgent care to be worked up. So I'm having her go to Edelston where she can be evaluated by social work. Meaning that I'm concerned about the history of this fracture, why it took so long for the patient to receive care for it, why the story changed and didn't seem to be inconsistent. There was a lot of red flags with this patient for non-accidental trauma. Did you say non-accidental trauma anywhere in the letter? No. In fact, Dr. Duxbury, um, when you inconsistencies. What inconsistencies are you talking about? So major red flags for non axial trauma, delay in care, changing story. What, how did the story change? So initial, the time frame kept changing while I talked to her. The mechanism where you're saying, well, first she injured herself by falling into a hole and then the next day she injured herself at practice. That's not consistent with something that would happen. Okay. But her story did not change. She, said she came to you and said that the child had fallen into a hole, and she told you the child had then had a second occurrence and fell into a, uh, as a result of gymnastics. Okay, fair enough. And um, it's true also that she told you she was the foster mother. She said that she was the foster mother. She never mentioned that the patient was in defects care. But she never told, well, by definition, if she's in foster mother, she's in defects care. I don't know whether that's true or not. Okay, well, isn't it true that she did not say anything to you about being adopted, the child being adopted? It says on her, it says on the intake form that she's adopted. She wrote that. She also, she did not write adopted. She did write foster mother, didn't she? She wrote adopted right there underneath reason, adopted history of abuse. Are you trying to say that Piedmont Henry is written by the same person as wrote, wrote adopted? Yes. So she would have written, you are telling this jury, she would have written foster mother on the right-hand side and adopted on the left-hand side. Everything on the left-hand side of the form was filled out by the guardian. You don't know that to be the case. That's what it was planned. But in fact, somebody else wrote adopted on there, not the same person that wrote Piedmont Henry. And all of these were. This is not the same handwriting. OK. I can't confirm that. She checked no to the question, was there a family history of this or a similar problem? I'm sorry, she checked no to She what? checked no to that, didn't she? About was, whether there was a family history of this. Family history of fracture? Yes. She did check no to that. And um, she also checked no to any past medical history, didn't she? Correct. 
but somebody wrote in history of abuse under adopted, correct? H axis it, it, history. It says history of abuse. Now, is it not true, Doctor, that you and Miss um, Rosenbaum had a discussion about whether or not about your price list? Isn't that correct? About my price list? Yes. No, that isn't something I would discuss. And you did not discuss what you would cover by Medicaid and what you wouldn't? I can't discuss that, and I don't know what Medicaid covers. I don't have anything to do with billing. All I do, I, I see the patients, I provide the treatment plan, but as far as the billing side of it goes, I have nothing to do with that. Someone in your office has something to do with that, correct? Yes, ma'am. Isn't it true that Ms. Rosenbaum went directly to another doctor? No, that's not true. Why it's is my that? understanding she went several days later to another doctor. How many days later? I believe two or three. Two or three days later from when you saw her? Yes, ma'am. To Dr. Coppinger? Doctor, I'm not sure who Dr. Coppinger is. But you're saying that two or three days after she saw you, she went to see another doctor? I believe she went to go see a mid-level provider. And you say that was two to three days? I, I believe so. I'm not sure on the exact timeline after that. I know that she didn't go to Eggleston that day and that it took several days after that for her to be seen by somebody else. Where in your medical records, doctor, is the referral sheet for Eggleston? There is no referral to Eggleston. So there's no mention here of you no would, sheet given to her saying to go to Eggleston, just you, your verbal? You wouldn't do a referral sheet to Eggleston. You would just tell her to go to Eggleston? Yes. Referral sheets are required when they're seeing another provider that insurance would require a referral for. There is no referral required to go to emergency department. But usually when somebody tells somebody to go to another establishment, you provide them with documentation that they should do so. No, ma'am. Okay. We would have provided her with the address of Eggleston and we would have alerted them to let them know that she was coming. And where is that reflected in your notes? It's not. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Doctor, is the, uh, the letter that we saw uh, that's in the med medical records part of the medical record? Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. That letter is part of the medical record? It is. Right. And what's the, what's the date on that, on that document? 10-20-2015. And in that document, do you actually mention the need for her to go to Eggleston? Yes. And this is not something you're making up today, correct? No. And why would you, um, why would you send someone to Eggleston versus back to, say, Hudson Bridge? So although they both are called Children's Health Care of Atlanta, they're very different entities. Um, Hudson Bridge is an urgent care to, it's a, Portal. It's somewhere to see minor injuries and treatment. Eggleston is, is the only level one pediatric trauma center in the state of Georgia. So if you're concerned, they are a tertiary care facility where all of the needed resources are in one place to do a proper workup. You have emergency medicine doctors, pediatricians, orthopedists, um, access to imaging, access to labs at that time, um, social work and, and child protective services all underneath the same roof. Is the, is the uh, are you familiar with the Stephanie V. Blank Center for Safe and Healthy Children? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with the Stephanie V. Blank Center for Safe and Healthy Children, the child protecting team? 
At Eggleston? Yes. I've dealt with them, yes. Okay. And are they, also con are, are they also contained at the Eggleston campus? There is, to my understanding, in-house Child Protective Services. Um, the fact that the, there was a further delay uh, between your visit and when she went to go see Mr. Coppinger, um, did that cause you any, does that cause you any more concern? Yes. And why is that? Uh, so another red flag for non-accidental trauma is provider, provider shopping. And what do you mean by that term? Seeing multiple providers. Okay. And why is that concerning? Well, it, it, you have to question why, if it's a straightforward injury, why are they, it's not like they're going for a second opinion. They're seeing multiple providers for the same problem. Did Ms. Rosenbaum seem confused at all when you told her she needed to go to Eggleston? No. Did she, uh, did it, did it appear to you that she didn't understand your directions when you uh, told her to go to Eggleston? No, she acknowledged that she needed to go to Eggleston. Nothing further. Anything in Dr. Sankara, the letter to Dr. Sankara that reflects you gave a copy of that letter to Jennifer Rosenbaum? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Anything in the letter to Dr. Sankara that reflects that you gave a copy of that letter to Jennifer Rosenbaum. In order for her to get a copy of a medical record, she would have to request it through the medical records department. That's the law. But you did not give her a copy of the letter. You... Uh, I don't know if she asked for a copy of the letter. In fact, isn't it true that sometimes people don't have the best of bedside manners? Isn't that correct? Yes, that is correct. And isn't it true that people go to other places? That's true. And isn't it true that sometimes one doctor doesn't cover, doesn't cover certain uh, procedures or cert include certain um, treatment in, in uh, their Medicare coverage. There was no treatment that wasn't covered. I took every, as far as I know, every insurance that is available in the state of Georgia, including Medicare and Medicaid, whereas I believe the provider she went to afterwards does not see Medicaid and Medicare patients. But you don't know that, do you? Excuse me? You don't know that to be the case. As far as I know, Children's Orthopedics of Atlanta did not take Medicare. That The only two Medicare or Medicaid providers in the state for pediatric orthopedics were Emory and Pediatric Orthopedic Associates. So you don't know much about billing in your office, but you do know about the billing in somebody else's office. I know what insurance they took. Isn't it true, doctor, that two to three days is sometimes the time it takes to get an appointment? For an urgent care, probably not. But for an orthopedist? No, we would regularly see people the next day. But other providers might take, might have full appointment schedules, correct? They might. They might. And they might take two or three days to get in to see? Perhaps. Thank you. No problem. All right, thank you, doctor. You can step down. Thank you. And uh, any Objection to being excused. Not in the state. If I could confirm. Oh, I would like the opportunity to recall him, Your Honor. Judge, he's here from Texas and he's flying back. Um, I, I don't. Uh, the defense is free to fly back if they wish, um, but his his flight is to go back to Texas. He's excused. Well, may I ask him one last question before we leave? Uh, let's see if he's still up here.
Yes, sir. Doctor, I'm going to show you what I've marked as Defendant's Exhibit 121. Can you tell me what that is? It's a billing sheet. And where is that billing sheet from? Pediatric Orthopedic Associates. Is that where you were working when you treated Layla? Yes. And is that reflect what Medicaid will cover and what your office will not accept? I don't know. Take a look at it and see if that refreshes your recollection. So I don't know what Medicaid would cover and I don't know what my office would accept. Okay. But this is your office's sheet, isn't it? Yes. Okay. And this is what your office, uh, <coughs> what is covered by insurance or not covered, correct? I don't know. Your Honor, at this time I would tender Defendant's Exhibit 121. Considering it's already part of State 182, we have no objection. All right. We would ask you the tender of evidence and if we may display it, Your Honor. Okay, it's admitted to separate exhibit and we may display it. <clears throat> what does that document say, doctor, with regards to your office policy? You want me to read it? Yes. The following supplies are not covered by the above insurance companies. When distributed through this office, you can purchase any of these items listed below from our office, for which payment is due up front or the physician can write a prescription and we will gladly give you a list of supplies who can bill these insurance directly for purchase. And is Medicaid one of the recipients of the insurances above? Yes, it says Medicaid, Peach Care, Amerigroup, Peach State, and WellCare, which are all Medicaid. Thank you, Doctor. Did you even have any, do you recall any conversation with Ms. Rosenbaum whatsoever about any, uh, any concerns paying for any of these? No, and I'm, I'm not sure where this questioning is getting at because there's nothing on that list that would have been needed to treat her fracture.